you talk about an extreme minority. Say you're the only Protestant in an auditorium of Roman Catholics, each and every one of which believe you're a heretic, and that it, it would be a service to God to kill you. Okay? The tide was turned in the colonial period. It was, for the first time in history, the Catholics who were the extreme minority. And these Catholics wanted religious liberty. Never before in the history of the Roman Catholic Church, from its very beginnings, by Simon Magus, back in the earliest days, has Rome ever advocated religious liberty. There's no such word as religious freedom in the Roman Catholic language, in Roman Catholic canon law. And they've got over a millennium of history proving their thesis. Okay? If you're not Roman Catholic, you don't have a right to live. And you receive grace from God if you kill a heretic, a Protestant. Now these Catholics in the colonies, they're talking religious liberty. Why? Because they're in a room full of, an auditorium full of Protestants who believe that they represent the Antichrist of the Bible. And so they literally did anything and everything they could to preserve their lives and preserve their faith so they could raise themselves to power eventually and overthrow the Protestant majority. That day is today. How many people do you know that even know the definition of Protestantism? Do yourself a favor. Go to any good search engine on the computer. And type in the word Protestantism, definition, and read what it says. For the first time in most people's lives, they will hear the true definition of Protestantism. It protests the papacy. Okay? A sect of Christians who believe that the Pope, whoever he is in whatever generation, the Pope is the Antichrist. That's what you find, right, in Wikipedia or any other, any, any other source. And you ask a Protestant today what it is to be a Protestant, they can't tell you. If you ask them what they protest, they can't tell you. They certainly won't tell you the Pope. Do you think maybe these minority, these extreme minority Catholics in the early colonial period have indeed grown in strength and in power and in influence and control, such control that a Protestant today can't even tell you who he protests? Challenge yourself. Go out in your community and just ask the simple question, what is a Protestant? And I dare say not a one in all the time you invest in this investigation, not a one of them will mention the word Pope or Papal or anything like it. The real meaning and definition of Protestantism is virtually gone in this country. Oh yes, there are a handful, but as a, as a percentage of the population, they're almost gone. They don't have a voice. You don't hear me on shortwave. You don't hear me in the mainstream media. Somebody even said one day that he was going to make me a star to compete with Alex Jones, and I laughed in his face. You've got to be kidding me. The truth is never going to be popular in this world. I'm going to be hated and loathed and pursued till the day I die. And for you to think that the truth is ever going to be accepted in this world, I got a bridge to sell you in Rome. The truth has never been popular. Okay, the truth today is called hate speech for crying out loud. I've got people pursuing me effectively pursuing me for my incessant 
harping about the papacy being the Antichrist and about the papacy being in control of our government and our schools and our churches and our foreign policy and our domestic policy. The Pope is the Antichrist. Don't look for another. If you are, you will be deceived. And I've named names. I match their names with their faces. I make the truth easily, the historical, the biblical, and the prophetic truth easily recognizable for those that just get off their duff and check it out. To this new world order, if I'm ever given a voice, I'll be a lethal threat, just like the Protestant reformers were. They didn't even have to lift a finger. All they had to do was get out their Bible, sit down, and show people from the Bible and from history that the Antichrist can be none other than the papacy. Fulfills all the prophecies of Daniel, all the prophecies of Paul, all the prophecies of the Apostle John, all of it. I mean, how can anyone read Revelation chapter 17 and not know it's talking about the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. But if you were to go to any of the churches in this country today and suggest such a thing, you'd be ushered to the door. If you're lucky. When you tell the truth, you better be accustomed with persecution. You better be accustomed to resentment. You better be accustomed to backbiting. You better be accustomed to somebody trying to trip you up all the time. To make a mockery of you. Because your kind just aren't compatible with the new world order. Well, I don't run from persecution. I don't try to cause any more than I possibly have to in order to get this message out. But I'll tell you one thing. History shows that there's no tolerance for the truth. Okay? Catholics, for the first time in their history, in the colonial period, were denied certain occupations and rights. In the old world order, they had all the rights. Matter of fact, they had the divine right. Okay, the papacy, uh, the papacy declares for itself the divine right to rule over the kings of the earth, to be as it were God Almighty on the earth. That the Pope is God, hidden under a veil of flesh. Only he, only the Pope has the divine right to rule the world. Only the Pope is the judge of every man, and no man may judge him. And even Pope Paul VI had to, well, stop using the time-honored custom of sitting in his great white throne at the, at the uh, St. Peter's Square in the Yellow Room. He is the self-styled King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he will not cease until he controls the entire world. Let me tell you something else about the colonies, the colonials, the Protestant colonists. To them, it wasn't altogether that long ago, a few centuries, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Now, Tom, what does that have to do with this discussion? Didn't you know Christopher Columbus was an emissary of Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain and that Spain was devoutly Roman Catholic, the most Catholic country in the world, including Italy, and it was Spain in the name of the Pope who launched Columbus's expedition to the New World to plant the papal flag on this hemisphere. You see, the God of all the earth has the right to be the judge in all lands, doesn't he? And if you find a new land somewhere in this world, then the very first thing you ought to do is plant a papal flag and extend his jurisdiction and power 
to that new land. And that's exactly what Christopher Columbus was assigned to do. Conquer all lands for the Pope. That was the decree from the papal chair. So Spain and Portugal went on global expeditions to claim the whole world for the Pope. And Christopher Columbus did plant the papal flag. And he began, just as the Roman Catholic Church began, by killing those who would not bend the knee to the Pope. He was a slaughtering, bloodthirsty killer. And, of course, they never tell you that when they celebrate Columbus Day in this country, because that might wake up the Protestants. We just celebrate Columbus Day, 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Nobody will tell you he carried the papal flag. Nobody will tell you he came from Ferdinand and Isabel of Spain, devout Roman Catholics, dead set determined to conquer all lands for the Pope and to make every creature a Catholic. Even the primitive natives of Central, South, and North America. And because the people wouldn't bend the knee to the Pope and surrender to this Roman horde, Columbus went on a killing spree and depopulated the, any opposition there was. They don't tell you that in the history books, do they? You still proud of Christopher Columbus? 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue? I want to weep every year when I hear somebody on the radio or television talk about Columbus Day, as though it's a day of celebration, a day of democracy. The papacy is not a democracy. It is a dictatorship, a satanic dictatorship. And the day when that satanic dictator gets control of a land, you better believe there's not going to be any religious liberty. And for Protestants today, well, you can keep calling yourself a Protestant so long as you believe in a future Antichrist that hasn't come yet. Just so long as you obey the civil laws of this land, which are written to conform you to compliance to Roman Catholic canon law. You don't have to know you're Roman Catholic to be Roman Catholic. As long as you are under the jurisdiction and control and laws of the papal throne, you can call yourself chicken soup. The Pope doesn't care. But that's how it all started. Less than 1% of the population were Catholics in this country. The rest were Protestants, very knowledgeable Protestants, knowledgeable in the Scriptures, knowledgeable in history, knowledgeable in prophecy, and they knew from history and the Bible and prophecy that these few Roman Catholics in this colony represented Satan himself. And they feared him. They resented him. They loathed him. They would not let them rule over them like they did in Europe. They weren't allowed to have responsible positions. They were not allowed to practice the Mass. They were not allowed to practice their children, uh, practice their religion. They were not allowed to baptize their children. You think, well, how could Protestants be so cruel? It was a matter of self-defense. How many millennia do Protestants have to suffer before they're justified in trying to protect themselves from papal tyranny? Wasn't a millennia and a half enough? Must we suffer again? Because of your forgetfulness? What about all the martyrs of Jesus throughout history who died at the hands of the papacy? Do we just forget about them? We already have. We already have. And to talk about the martyrs of the old world order, the God-fearing, Bible-reading, Jesus-worshipping Protestants, those who protested the papacy all the way back to the beginning, long before the Protestant Reformation, do we dare to forget them? You don't read about them at all in the schools or in the churches, or in the mainstream media, or anywhere else. They want you to forget that. Well, I guarantee you, Francis Rooney, a Jesuit-trained Roman Catholic, hasn't forgotten it. He may not talk much about it, but he knows about it. And I believe he also knows what his role will be as a U.S. ambassador to the Holy See, and even after his term is over. 
The imperative for Roman Catholics is still the same. Conquer all lands for the Pope. And that's still Francis Rooney's occupation. Okay? Catholics were even denied religious liberty in their own Maryland colony. Because the Protestants feared religious liberty for Catholics. They knew the dangers. Now, you don't hear talk about them going around killing Catholics, burning Catholics at the stake, stretching them on racks, torturing them in dungeons. You don't hear about torture. They just denied them responsible positions in government. Wouldn't allow them to vote. If you allow a Catholic to vote, he's going to vote for a Catholic. And they, too, will overthrow, eventually, Protestantism by overthrowing the government and making it Catholic and then imposing Roman Catholicism on the Protestants. History has already proven that thesis. Okay, I beat this to death, but I'll tell you, it's, it's just something that we need to know about and something you are not likely to hear from anywhere in this country today, especially in this new world order where it's become an offense to criticize anybody's religion. Anyway, the author continues, he says, initially Maryland was, Maryland was intended to be the exception to the rule. Okay, Maryland was going to make itself a model for religious liberty. We've got to convince these Protestants that we're no threat to them. We've got to have religious liberty in Maryland. Of course, that's what you say when you're an extreme minority. You ever faced with a gang of thugs who want to beat your head in? You get real cooperative. You get real friendly. You wear a great big smile. And that's what the Catholics did. Well, we want religious liberty. Never mind the millennium and a half of religious persecution perpetrated upon anybody that was not a Roman Catholic in the old world order. We want religious liberty in this one. By cracky. Okay? Initially, Maryland was intended to be the exception to the rule. The colony was founded by a Catholic Englishman, Cecil Calvert, better known as the Second Lord Baltimore. Okay, well, Lord Baltimore. That's what they called the leader of the Maryland colony. I don't know where they get it, but Lord Baltimore was his title. His name was Cecil Calvert. Now, his father, George better known as the second Lord Baltimore. Uh, Calvert, uh, Calvert, uh, rather, Calvert's father, George, the first Lord Baltimore, I hope not to be confusing, Cecil was the second Lord Baltimore. George, his father, was first Lord Baltimore. Had been granted a charter by King Charles I in 1632 to form a settlement along the Potomac River. Why they chose the Potomac River, I don't know. But... Roman Catholics will tell you it was Providence, okay? Along the Potomac River, there was a tributary called Guess. You'll never guess in a million years, Tiber, Tiber Creek. And there was a settlement called Rome, okay? So, so Catholics, thinks it, thinks, Catholics think that it was divine Providence, and it says, while never receiving as an exclusive Catholic, uh, while never conceived as an exclusively Catholic enclave, Maryland was meant to be a place where Catholics might enjoy, quote, mutual love and amity, unquote, with Protestants, quote, free from persecution on account of their religion, unquote. Mutual love and amity with Protestants? Never before in history. But that was the byword of these Catholics. Love and amity with Protestants. Freedom from persecution on account of religion. I mean, this is the biggest load of hooey since hooey was invented. And the Protestants weren't biting. But the Catholics, in order to survive, had to champion religious liberty no matter what.